Welcome to the December 6, 2021 Rotary Meeting in Lexington, Massachusetts. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by past President Jim Freeling, the One Verse of America by past President Dominic Zakari, uh, the invocation pres past President Dom, Sh Dom Sherman, and the welcome will be by past President Michelle. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My country is a peace, sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side. After listening to that, I have no <laughs> doubt that the Lord is listening to everything we say. Amen. And maybe he will forgive you for that singing. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, <clears throat> King of the universe, who bringeth forth bread from the earth. Amen. 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 I, see I was going to say cut. <laughs> Take two. Dominic, you're not going to get a deep contract. Oh, I can't. He doesn't want it. The Secretary's report. Yes, President Frank, please. Uh, President Cleve, it's my pleasure today to do the uh, weekly attendance. Uh, today we have 14 members in attendance, one visiting Rotarian, and two guests. And by way of introduction, uh, Past President Spencer, could you... Yes, well, me? we have District Governor Terry with us today. She will be making a presentation in a little bit to the club. Oh, Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. And Past President Murray, would you introduce the guests at your table? With pleasure, Secretary Frank. So we have here together with us um, Christiana Severi, uh, Lexington Police Department Sergeant. Sergeant welcome. Severi. Welcome. 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 Thank to you. <laughs> And we have Commissioner William Gross of the Boston Police Department. Retired. Retired. <laughs> now you can tell he's not too happy. And he'll be speaking with us a little later. Welcome. 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 And uh, before I relinquish this spot, I'd like to uh, have a special thank you to Christiana. She was uh, being a very astute police officer. She noticed that my name tag was upside down. <laughs> and so I've now put it right side up, and hence I have avoided, I'm sure, a fine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Past President uh, Frank. Past President Michelle, could you lead us in the uh, welcome song? Okay, Ro Rotarian Rise. <laughs> Don't let it lag. <laughs> we welcome you to Lexington to meet with us today. Our door is always open to our friends in Rotary. We're glad to have you with us and we hope you'll come again to Rotary Lexington. We all say welcome visiting Rotarians. Welcome all you non-Rotarians. Welcome to our club in Lexington. We hope you'll come again. That's right. Very good, Rotarian. Vines and happy dollars. That's President Dan. President Cleve, I have a, a $5 fine for past President Don Sherman who failed to enter his lunch order on time. And not only that, he put in the wrong order. <laughs> so that's $5. And then I have 20 happy dollars because uh, I'm retired. I'm happy. <laughs> I would like to propose a fine on Dan. <laughs> Which one? Hopefully him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's because another. That's another fine. I ate for that half sandwich, but his fine just gave me indigestion. <laughs> <laughs> that's another fine. It's past Keep president. Going. Past president. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I get that five. Thank past you. Past president Spencer. I have some happy dollars. I actually. Uh, I uh, got rid of uh, Groundhog's Day here and went traveling, went down to New Orleans for Thanksgiving. It was a lot of fun, saw the Saints game and, and ate some really good food. 
And for those people keeping track, I will have a teenage daughter in my house in one more week. Yes. It's very painful. And I'm wrong about everything already. And my wife's turning 29 again. So uh, Congratulations. And everything you do is dumb. <laughs> Anybody else? That's present. I just want to uh, pay some happy dollars. Uh, I bought a few tickets for my family for the raffle. And uh, my hopefully future daughter-in-law won won the Maybe grand prize. Maybe not now. Prize. I know. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll pay $100. Dan, can you bill me for that? Sure. Thank yeah. you. There's a fee on that. <laughs> Anybody else? In the show. That's President Frank. Uh, President Cleve, I have uh, 20 happy dollars. Uh, as the club knows, this past weekend we did our Sand for Seniors uh, delivery. So we delivered 44 buckets of ice melt to 44 uh, citizens of Lexington who were in need of ice melt. And we had astounding club participation. We had 12 Rotarians sign up to deliver the buckets. And this makes, I believe, our seventh year in a row of doing that. So I want to, I'm very ha happy, and I want to thank all the club members who participated. Thank you. Yes, President Michelle. Danny, will you bill me 20 happy dollars? I only have a hundred dollar bill in my wallet. That's all right. We can change. I'll get change. you the change later. So, I just want to thank everybody again for another successful year with the cash raffle. The tickets all got sold, um, and actually earlier than they did last year. So yeah. I just want to thank everybody that helped out and participated to raise. And we raised, how much money did we raise? Fourteen thousand. Netted um, just about netted just about fifteen thousand dollars for the scholarship. Yeah, so we we'll have plenty of money to give the scholarships out again this year. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. President, please. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have ten ten happy dollars because of the because of Sanford seniors. I thought I signed up, <laughs> but I forgot I did, and I forgot all about it. So if I did sign up, I'm sorry I didn't go. So I give ten happy. Dollars. <laughs> Anybody else? I see witticism runs amok. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll round it out with happy dollars. Uh, Twenty happy dollars, Sergeant at Arms. Sure. Remember my guests, the guests that are here. Uh, thank you very much, District Governor, for attending today for, with us. Uh, thanks to uh, Sergeant um, Christiana Sevilla, Lexington Police Department. She's uh, mentored a lot of young officers during her career at the Police Department. She's involved in a lot of special projects moving the department forward in the 21st century as far as policing is concerned. She functions as a patrol supervisor and also as a shift commander at times. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, my good friend, Commissioner Willie Gross. Um, we spent a lot of time together over our careers. We started about the same time, um, him in the Boston Police Department, me in the State Police. We see each other a lot of times at big scenes. A lot of them was fun things when the Red Sox won the championship, the Bruins, the Duck Boats. Some, uh, we also saw each other at a lot of crime scenes too, unfortunately. And one of the biggest things we always talk about is the uh, marathon bombings. From day one, when that happened on that tragic afternoon, we saw a lot of each other at the time I was with uh, on the governor's protection detail with the governor, and right up to that last uh, evening in Watertown, where a lot of you saw on the, on the TV, the uh, final arrest at the boat there. And we set up a uh, impromptu command post, and standing right to my left-hand side was the commissioner. We always say, remember, Watertown. <laughs> Something the commissioner has given me was a challenge coin, uh, probably about a year ago from the Boston Police Department. But do you have it? You have to drop some happy dollars. Uh, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Hey, Commissioner, I have a challenge coin for you from the state police. Yeah. That also too. Because yeah, so. I still have my challenge. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on, um, I'd like to bring forward um, District Governor Terry Curran, also past President Spencer. Um, the governor has a... Um, award for the uh, club and past presidents. A lot of what has happened here was during past presidents Spencer's term and also the previous uh, presidents. Mr. Governor. Thanks, Cliff. <clears throat> so as we, as we all know, last year was a very trying year as we were not in person at all. And generally we have 15 clubs or so get these awards. Um, I'm giving them out to eight clubs this year because that's all that um, were able to keep themselves together and do the best work and 
make even the minimal contributions to not only our foundation, but polio um, and all the things that we have going on. So the first banner that you get is 100% foundation giving of 100 average and 100% uh, percent participation. Thank you. From the Rotary Foundation. And then something we always talk about is E-Ray. So that's every Rotarian every year. And again, this club has 100% member participation, um, $100 per capita, so the two of them. This is a letter from the Chief Philanthropy Officer of the Rotary Foundation. I won't bore you with reading it, but you can frame it yourself because it's sent to me, but it's meant for all of you. And we really appreciate, um, you know, <coughs> everything that we give to the Rotary Foundation comes back to the districts in the form of grants and just helps all the work that we do, not only in our district, but throughout the world. And so um, I'm thankful that I'm able to give these out to somebody that somebody still donated <laughs> last year when, when things were so difficult. And I'm sure that I'll be back next year to give you this on my own behalf, because as we were sitting talking, this is just a club that believes in the foundation. And uh, I'm just so happy to be here with both of you. Thank you. Thank you for this. I'd like to thank the board because they really helped out with that, Dan and Frank from last year and Alan. So thank you to my board who were doing that as we were Zooming a lot of the meetings. Thank you uh, for all your hard work and thank you for all the club members for continuing to support the Rotary Foundation while I was president. So thank you guys for doing that. Can we just get one? Sure. And Governor, thank you, because of, because of this is what all of you do as Rotarians for this. Um, so I thank all of you, the membership, for all, all you do for us. Yeah, absolutely. At this point, I'm going to have the district governor stand, stand by, also past President Spencer. We have uh, two Paul Harris awards. We tried to keep them as a secret. We'll see if I did or not. But uh, past President Spencer is going to do the honors with the announcement on that. Sure. So the two people we'd like to come up, uh, first, Jim Freeling. Would you like to come forward? <laughs> Um, I think it's kind of uh, ironic. Uh, Jim does everything behind the scenes. Again, this weekend was no different with the Sanford seniors. Him and uh, Brookhaven were extremely uh, helpful in storing the buckets, getting them ready to be delivered. And it's just something that Jim has done many times and does it behind the scenes without a lot of recognition. But this is your Paul Harris plus five pin. So congratulations, Thank Jim. Thank you. Oh, this is a, um, you got stays or something. Yeah, I'm not getting through that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Perfect. That's it. Watch out for that. It doesn't uh, stick to you. Congratulations. Thank you. Here's your box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the second person is Michelle. Again, Michelle. Um, <laughs> Just finished the cash raffle again, even though I, I know she loves it secretly. Um, it's, our, it's always a hard work, and she does an excellent job. And again, um, it helps us uh, create the money that we need for our scholarships every year. So thank you for all your hard work again. Thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. That's okay, your lapel. I can get through that one. Oh, and this is Michelle's uh, plus two. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two well-deserved uh, awards or two well um, people who put a lot into Rotary. Michelle was the president when I first came on. She was very helpful, mentoring me as a young Rotarian first coming on. I met Jim Freeling over the years um, when I was with the Chamber of Commerce and different events, and I always said he's a squared away guy. He's got his act together. <laughs> Moving on to the business section, I'm going to kind of move pretty quickly with this because I want to leave as much time for our distinguished guest for his speaking uh, part. Um, the cash raffle was a big success, as Michelle has, uh, spoke about uh, earlier. Thank you, Michelle. Anything Thank you further? You already no, spoke. No, I think I already said it when I got up here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, San for seniors. Uh, thank you very much, Past President Frank, uh, for what you did for that and what you do every year for that. Anything it's, further? Uh, yes. Um, Sergeant at Arms, Allen, you can do all the refills. What? All the refills. <laughs> For the, the Sanford Sanford seniors. Refills. What? The you, sand refills? No you, problem. I, yeah. <laughs> what? I promise. I'll forget it. But I promise. <laughs> uh, if anybody has any pictures um, from this weekend, if they took any pictures, I'm going to post it up on Facebook later on today. So if you have any pictures, 
from you delivering, let us know. Otherwise, I have a couple. I'm probably on some surveillance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right the missing bucket. Oh, the missing bucket. There, there you go. Yeah. The missing bucket. bucket. <laughs> As I said, I have a teenage daughter, so I have pictures of everything. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, wait a minute. You want to take that back? <laughs> from the same no. procedure. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Toys for Tots. Past President um, Jim, thank you so much for what you, all you do every year for, for that. Um, as everybody knows, and Jim's going to speak for a little bit, but the, the final date is December 10th as far as drop-off. Yeah, so there's a drop-off box at Brookhaven. If, uh, I'll take them today, uh, but if not December 10th, you can just come up to Brookhaven and uh, come in the front door and drop them off. There's a box right in the lobby, and we appreciate everybody's help for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Past President Jim. Uh, Thanksgiving Day football, uh, as you know, this year we switched it over. We played against Concord. Um, the president of the uh, Concord Club, uh, Kyle Cushion, and I had a um, fun little wager as far as who was going to win. And unfortunately, we did we, we lost quite con uh, convincingly to Concord this year. So our club will be making a donation to Rotary's uh, Global Eradication Against Polio for um, $250 in, in the name of the uh, Concord Rotary. And next year, we're going to come back and uh, win. Go <laughs> minute. Go minute. Yeah. Uh, the holiday meeting, as you know, is December 20th. We are still working on the location with that. The possibility that we are going to um, go with Waxies as a location. During our board meeting, we actually reached out to Waxies, so we're waiting to formalize that. But we will be in contact as far as where our the location of our holiday meeting. And a lot went behind that. Pre Past President Murray, thank you for working on things you did with Santa. Uh, Past President Dominic, as you do every year for for that, and I know there's many others too that work on that project there. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, many of you received the email about wreaths across America. Um, at the board meeting, we decided we are going to make a donation uh, for to uh, ten wreaths, sponsor ten wreaths, I should say. And we're also going to send out the email again if anybody wants to uh, donate individually. You'll be able to. There's several links there that you'll be able to click on that and make donations um, for that there. Uh, last but not least, and most kind of important, we had a formal um, nomination for our next second vice president, Yanera, and um, the board um, unanimously is moving forward with the nomination for her, and she has in fact accepted that. Thank you very much. So, Terry, is anything further for business matters? No. Okay. At this point. Um, Weekly raffle. Okay. Weekly raffle, um, craft food halls, donations from craft food halls, Alex, Will Casal, Eagle Bank, Rotary Club of Lexington, Brickling Financial. All right, blue tickets. Last four numbers, eight, nine, six, seven. Congratulations. <laughs> go, up, go up there and get it, Christiana. Go up there and get Next ticket. No, she doesn't. Oh, I'm just going Anything that's here. Take the happy dollars. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next ticket. Nine zero five zero. Nine zero five zero. Yeah. Commissioner, come forward, please. Yes. <laughs> 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 Where's the flashlight? Oh, uh, oh. Would you like a flashlight? Well, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this will match the intellect of the Rotary Club. I'll take this. Thank yeah. you. What is it? Thank you. Chocolate Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> Next ticket. Eight, nine, six, four. Can I get it for you? You don't have to. Oh, sure. that's fine. I can still walk. <laughs> <laughs> Just slower than usual. Oh, lotion. Three more. 
Uh, next ticket, eight, nine, seven, six. That's mine, but I want to give that away to somebody else. Yeah. Who, would you like to, who would you like to give it to? Huh? Who would you like to give it to? How about the cameraman? Okay. The cameraman could have it. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. for the camera. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 But we're going to give you one anyway. <laughs> What do I have? What do I have? Wow. That's a five dollar gift card. One of those two drink things. <laughs> Excellent choice. <laughs> All right. We're down to the last two valuable prizes. Eight, nine, seven, eight. For the cameraman. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Five-dollar gift card or the drink thing? Okay. Yes. All right. And last but Thank not you. least. Eight nine six eight. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> the Eagle Bank. Uh, yeah, you can never have enough. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. All right, that concludes our cash. <laughs> For our speaker introduction, past President Murray, could you do the honors, please? Yeah. 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 Ye
August of 2018 to January of 2021. Well, let me tell you something about his wonderful biography. William G. Gross was born in 1964. He was the son of a single mother in rural Maryland. And he was the middle of three children. And then they moved to Boston at age 12. And Willie became a true Bostonian. He just embraced everything and anything around him. He, was, he worked hard, but part of that work was just enjoying accomplishing things. He graduated from the Boston Technical High School, uh, and that is currently the uh, School of Mathematics and Science in Boston. So it's the O'Brien. O'Brien, yeah, O'Brien School, a very well-known school, and an honor to be there. And then he entered the Boston Police Cadet Program, becoming patrol officer in two years later. He accomplished a lot, and he included in his um, accomplishments receiving an associate in science degree in criminal justice from Quincy College. In 2017, I think you were awarded your degree. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. As a patrol officer, he was just unbelievable in what he participated in. He was in the Anti-Youth Violence Strike Force and the Drug Control Unit, and then later actually became an instructor at the Boston Police Academy. No doubt, very highly, very high accomplishments. And his rankings in the Boston Police Department are absolutely outstanding and exemplary. He became sergeant, sergeant detective, Deputy Superintendent in 2008, and then the ultimate, becoming Commissioner of the Boston Police Department in the year 2018 under Mayor Marty Walsh. So many things that we could say about Willie, but he is going to have some very interesting things which he's going to speak to us about, and I cannot have a higher honor and satisfaction and happiness than introducing Commissioner Willie Gross. Thank you, sir. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. And thank you so much for the invitation to the Rotary Club of Lexington. And I'm, I wouldn't have heard anything else, but I'm going to get you if I didn't show up today, <laughs> Mr. President. So I was waiting for that look he does. He's a very studious look. So, Governor, thank you. Mr. President, past president. President and my sergeant, Sergeant Severe. Again, it's an honor to be here today and um, service above self. Just in the brief moments I was here, I can see that you all exude that, especially in your philanthropic endeavors to the community. That's very important because most people don't do that anymore. They'll sit in Monday morning quarterback, but they don't go forward to help out those in need or recognition of our great seniors, especially our veterans of foreign war. Just, you're good folks and I appreciate it. And here's a hundred happy dollars to commit to your philanthropic endeavors. <laughs> Master at Arms, Sergeant at Arms, no? All right, you, you better get up here. I'm telling you. <laughs> Put it right here. I didn't know if that's the raffle box, but thank you. But thank, you. thank you very much. And I'll talk more about philanthropic endeavors later because it's very important. So what about me? People often ask, where do you come from? What are you doing here? Why do you do what you do? So thank you for that wonderful introduction. You touched upon um, where I was from originally. That's Hillsborough, Maryland, population 164. <laughs> kind of reminds you of Mayberry RFD. Right? That means rural free delivery. <laughs> That's how rural it was. It's on the eastern shore of Maryland, Caroline County, about 68 miles away from Baltimore. So yes, I was raised on a pig farm for the first 11 years of my life. But why do I bring that up? No matter how poor you are, sometimes you don't know it. Because I was rich in family, morals, respect, honor, and a lot of humor too, because sometimes you have to be able to laugh just to alleviate stress. But on that farm, 
um, it was my mother and Miss Robina Frame who mentored my mother and made her get the hell out of there. She's like, you're too smart um, for the farm. Um, sometimes people have vision for you before you can see it. She's like, you take off, um, and I'll take your little Willie for a while. But I never wanted to leave that farm. And I was asked several times by my mother, I'm like, nope, I want to stay. I want to stay. As he um, moved on to Baltimore and then Boston with my two sisters. Older sister, younger sister. I'm the only son. That's why I'm an angel. Thank you. <laughs> but let's talk about um, what happened on that farm, that atmosphere, that community. It was poor whites and poor blacks. For the most part, everyone got along. I, I got to say, in the country atmosphere, if you don't like someone, you just don't talk to them. I bring that up because something was happening in the 60s, the Vietnam War. And I remember going to Bethesda, Maryland as a young child, visiting the soldiers, seeing how injured they were. And um, it's amazing how many smiles I got. It's a little kid there, and they're like, hey, how you doing? You know, my nickname, Champ. Uh, not from champion eating, from boxing. But anyway, that gave me a love and re not a love, it taught me about the love of your country, honor and duty, because a lot of those individuals were forced to go to war. You know, poor blacks, poor whites. Um, and some of the hypercritics of the day, as I researched my history, bought their way out of it or went to college and criticized those that went to serve. So not only did I get a love for my country and those that served, the veterans of foreign war, but also a passion, right? And the ability to have empathy, sympathy, care, and respect, and not be a hypercritic until you talk to people. So on that farm, I learned to read from the Bible, Bible encyclopedia. There is a God, because I didn't catch on fire yet. And um, <laughs> Ebony Jet, Ebony Jet Encyclopedia, anything I could get my hands on, I read. And thus began my, my um, rich love of history, but all-inclusive history, all-inclusive biblical history, all-inclusive world history, and all-inclusive American history. I think it's very important that when you're teaching the children of our country, moving them forward, educating them, bringing them wisdom, tell the entire history of what happened, good or bad, so that when they're, in the, when they're in the classroom, their fellow students, there's going to be a mutual respect right from the start. It also helps to break negative stereotypical views and perceptions about individuals and about how our country was formed by everybody from everywhere. So that started my deep love of history, and I still have it today. I love debate and naysayers. I'm like, bring it. Let's go. Let's see what you know. I'll even teach you guys something, and ladies, before I end my speech, that I've mentored several students and talked to several students, I always give them a little question that they can respectfully ask of adults so they can move forward and adults can learn that we can learn from the babes. So back to Maryland, there was everybody on the farm, but eventually almost everyone left, and I was left with grandma. And because of family hardships, we had to go. That's how I arrived in Boston in September of 1975. I was a little chubby, or they say portly, or big boned it, yeah. <laughs> kid. And um, um, I was moved to 92 Esmond Street in Dorchester, right? <laughs> but it, this, says, this, this section of Dorchester was in Franklin Park, we were near Franklin Field and Franklin Hill. And it was a very tumultuous time. I mean, I came into the city, there was this thing called forced busing. And it was like a war zone, a racial war zone in the city. And I never forget the lessons my mother was teaching me. You can't go here and you can't go there. I'm like, why? Because of this forced busing, people aren't going to like you because of the color of your skin. And then the same goes for F. Caucasian people came to Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan. There was just one big beef going on. But thank God for the way I was raised. I'm kind of this type of person. I'm not going to criticize you until I met you first. 
and then we'll see what we have to say. That's how I was raised. You can say, I don't like this person, I don't like that person. You shouldn't like them either because I don't like them. I'm not like that. So it was a blessing to be raised on the farm because I didn't have a predisposition to hate anyone. And I, I was a stubborn little portly kid too. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> Unless your mom and grandma. You don't mess with southern grandmothers. <laughs> And you don't mess with uh, my mother either. So. so why did I bring up in 1975? Being in Boston, man, imagine a kid from Hillsborough, Maryland, talking to the city kids for the first time. What time does Hee Haw come on? What are you talking about? <laughs> Once y'all Google that, you're going to laugh even harder. Y'all watch Andy Griffiths? Y'all watch this? And Nope. They're like, what are you talking, where are you from, kid, right? But it was great. My mother recognized something, too, that it often takes a village to raise a child. So within three to four days, she marched me down to Franklin Field, where there was a brave soldier that just returned from the Vietnam War, Harry Wilson. And his brother, Dennis Wilson, started um, a football team called the Roxbury Raiders. Those were my father and uncle figures for years. So the love of veterans of foreign war, God has a plan. Within three days, I'm talking to a veteran of foreign war, right? And he had a hellish time in Vietnam. He saw some severe action. But he established a football team. And again, takes a village. I've never seen my father. My mother. Is my father and mother. But it was good to have someone in the village to help raise me. And then this thing that I moved into called an apartment building, it didn't look like the house with the tin roof and tar shingles with the Bowman gas tanks on the side. I remember going into the apartment. I'm like, where's the rest of the house? <laughs> but there were six apartments in that six apartment building, rather. And three families were. Vietnam vets, and they looked out for me. A green kid from Hillsborough, Maryland, and there's many predators out there, and there's many people that would try to influence you and take advantage um, of you. And again, God works in mysterious ways because those Vietnam vets and that community really took care of me. I was that green. And since I mentioned the color green, let's talk about my first St. Patrick's Day in the bicentennial year. Now I'm trying to be cool now. September 75, now we're moving forward, watching our three television stations. And then um, 1976, everyone kept talking about St. Patrick's Day on TV, all these celebrations, right? So my mother worked at Sears. So my first St. Patrick's Day was hilarious, as my friends still remind me. As I came out of the house that day, it was very, a very warm day, believe it or not. And I had the only football in the neighborhood, so I had about 14 or 15 kids waiting for me on the, on the adjacent street. I come over, and everyone's like, I'm like, what? They're like, what are you wearing? I'm like, whoa, it's new. Because back then, your gear had to be fresh, <laughs> right? <clears throat> Here's what I had on a green football jersey, green, green shorts, green socks, and green sneakers. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, what? It's St. Patrick's Day. They're like, not for you. Didn't you get it? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I remember force busting this and that. I'm like, I didn't see it. <laughs> but we'll bring that up a little later. But I had a great childhood in the city. It was a very challenging neighborhood. Very challenging, um, but for the most part, excellent people, great people. Again, oftentimes, 1% or 2% can dictate in the minds of those looking in that, oh, the entire neighborhood's that way. That was not the case. Myself and my mother were welcomed in with open arms with my older and younger sister. My older sister, Waltine, who we call Pinky, and my younger sister, Davida, the militant. Uh, She's going to probably watch this. Bring it. Anyway. <laughs> I went to the Oliver Wendell Home School. 
good history again. And um, that's where I witnessed forced busing at first hand, that students from South Boston came in. And as you're talking as a kid, you know, we like the same thing, cartoons, sports, different music. I was into soul music, they were into Kiss and heavy metal, but still the love of music. And then for some reason, the people that exuded the most hate were the adults. And I often ask the question, I'm like, if the schools weren't equal, the supplies weren't on the same level, the teaching, why don't we just get more supplies and hire new teachers and fire the ones that aren't doing their jobs on both sides? Because you soon, I know what I learned quickly and soon, that you can't tell any neighborhood in Boston what to do. It's not a color thing, it's a Boston thing. This is where our country began. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Boston. You can't tell people what to do. So I quickly learned people are the same. It depends on what they've been through, how they're raised, their social groups, that can change their opinions. But thank God we all have the ability to change and learn. If you don't believe that, look up, remember biblical history, Look up the Cory of Jesus Christ's disciples. You'll see what I mean. They were not nice guys before they became his disciples. So people have the ability to change. Again, that's the importance of learning history. You'll learn that you're not alone, and you can change your life. So growing up in the hood as a country boy, I still had some things left over from my country upbringing and those television shows, Bonanza, Ponderosa. Gunsmoke, The Rifleman, uh, Charlie Chan Theater, Alfred Hitchcock Theater. Get that theme? Law enforcement. I always wanted to be a sheriff, deputy, state police. That was just for you, by the way. <laughs> My Boston guys are going to get me like, what? But law enforcement, I loved it, I loved it, I loved it, loved it. But imagine in a city where... It was racially tumultuous, sharing that with your friends. They're like, what are you, crazy? And as I gained on in my years, I still stuck by it. The love of football, love law enforcement. And I'm going to tell you, back then in Boston, I don't care what color the cop was, usually wasn't a nice thing. Black cops, white cops, you just didn't want to see them. It was a whole different culture and atmosphere then, totally different. So I went into Boston Technical High School, loved it. Never had a bad day in high school, and it was very diversified. That's the importance as well as diversifying um, your law enforcement communities because you learn about different cultures and ethnicities, and you learn firsthand about who people really are, and it shouldn't be based on negative stereotypical views and perceptions. So Boston Tech, excellent, a lot of fun, Learned a lot of things. So I graduate, graduated in 1982, and I followed my dreams. So I said, hey, there's an opportunity to join the Boston Police Department in an apprenticeship role called the Boston Police Cadets, in which I joined in 1983. So my start with Boston Police, the Boston Police Department was August 10, 1983, at 18 and a half years old. And I went in very cocky. <laughs> like, I know how this city is, no one's going to talk crap to me, and no one's going to do this, and no one's going to do that. Because my rich sense of history taught me that no matter what I look like, I have a right to be here. And if you want change, be the change as well. I quickly learned that not all white cops were bad, and not all black cops were good. If you're a jerk, you're a jerk. But I also learned something else. Find out, find, find out why that person is a jerk. And then you'll learn, like, wow, is that why? Oftentimes, the people that had a negative thought pattern about people from the inner city, people of color, I'm like, what happened? They had a negative experience. And they were never taught true history about the importance of history. So I often educated folks about Dr. Charles Drew, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, 
scientists, doctors, lawyers of color, and how several of those folks had interracial relationships and marriages. What? So again, the importance of history. So going on in that police department at 18 and a half, I learned a lot. And then there was an opportunity to take the Boston police exam. I scored a 99, and I went on in, se in September, excuse me, May 15th, 1985, and graduated in September 13th. Why do I even mention the score, though? I'm not bragging on myself. What'd you miss? Huh? What'd you miss? I misspelled my name. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> owe myself a happy dollar or something. Huh? Why do I mention the score? Very important. There were people at the time, even before the exam scores came in, you'll get it because you're black. Because of affirmative action. The Boston Police Department was sued in 1970 by African Americans and Latinos for improper, unfair hiring practices and promotional practices. The lawsuit came through to fruition in 1974, thus Boston was placed under a consent decree, one for one hiring and thus affirmative action until 1994. But it was continued by Paul Evans, a commissioner, until 2001. So the attitudes back then, you'll be all right, kid. You're going to get it anyway. I don't believe in that. You got to earn it. And so that's why I mentioned that score. Again, it's important to break these, these stereotypical views. So coming on as a young man, 1985, wow. Imagine the heat that I took from some people in my neighborhood on Esmond Street. Are you crazy? You're working for people that kill us? Are you crazy? But then I talked to a lot of seniors that said, hey, people of all colors died so you can have this opportunity, so you go ahead. And you're going to see some of the people that are hypercritics are going to be in the same place, doing the same thing, and you're going to move forward. As I alluded to earlier, some people have a vision for you, but you can't even see it yet. So I came on in 85. I started downtown, downtown Boston, Charlestown, East Boston. That was great, being 21, downtown, with lights and sirens. It was great, I'm telling you right now. But that was a probationary period. I swear I'll speed it up. Then I went to Dorchester as my first permanent station, 40 Gibson Street, Dorchester. Back to the hood that raised me. And that was great. Um, I looked through the eyes of a lot of seniors from cadet time until I graduated and my first permanent station. And thank God for seniors. They have no filter, and they'll tell you like it is. So I learned a lot about Boston that previously I didn't know because I didn't hail from Boston. And that, again, we all want the same things in life. What's good for your family, you want to be treated fairly, and you want a hell of a, a heaven of a quality of life. You just want to be happy. So I was able to go to those, those places, those sections of the city that I couldn't go to because of forced busing. And every time, everywhere I went, whether it's a black neighborhood, Latin, Irish, Italian, I talked to seniors, and that's who taught me the true game. What's that? The game of life. Sharing their lived experiences to help me move on so that my path to success would be much smoother than the roads that they had to traverse. So now I'll speed it up. I'll go through my career. 1985 to like 88, there was this movie called New Jack City, talking about crack cocaine, and it hit Boston hard. It hit every neighborhood, every ethnicity, and it was devastating the city. As we moved on, you know, I, I was a patrol officer from 1985 to 19, about 93. Then I went to the Youth Violence Strike Force, also known as the gang unit. And at that time, the city was in turmoil. From 1990 to 1994, 40 to 60 teenagers were being killed in the streets every year. That's unheard of. But what was wrong with Boston? We still had the same type of attitude. We're in our individual silos and in our individual neighborhoods. But I'm telling you, people were literally dying over drugs, whether it's the gangs fighting each other or the people dying and devastating families. 
But how did that change? People started to talk and realized that that entire village is going to have to get together to make some changes. For the police department, out of your individual silos and start talking to the community, the reverends, the teachers, institutions of higher learning, so we can look at things through a different lens. Criminalists, criminologists, sociologists, as well, our medical profession. Talking about post-traumatic stress syndrome, that it doesn't just affect veterans of foreign war, it affects people that have been traumatized by what they witnessed in not only their homes, but the streets and in their neighborhoods. Folks, this was a war. We were living in it. As well, the importance of something that you all, that I witnessed here with all of you, philanthropic endeavors. Also, businesses came forward to help fund programs and initiatives and to help kids of all ethnicities move forward. So how we got out of that war was we started to work together and created programs and initiatives together. BPD, the community, institutions of higher learning, the medical field, um, private sector with philanthropic endeavors, and guess what? Our professional sports teams, too, all kicked in. Then something happened. We hit the highest homicide rate ever, it was 154. When we all started working together, and it was a cultural change, wow. For the next two and a half years, there were no teenagers killed in the city of Boston. It's called the Boston Miracle Years. That really started the true acceptance of community policing in Boston. There were books written here, broken windows. Uh, we did a lot of um, work with um, the Kennedy School at Harvard, Northeastern, BU. And the mindset of the officers started to change as we started to interact as well and move forward. So after I left the gang unit, which was multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency, that's where I met my friends, the state police. And um, that used to be very adversarial. But again, I don't play that, as Mr. President knows. So then I went five years in the drug control unit. It's not like TV at all. The big glamorous cars, the fancy apartments, 95%. You go into an apartment, there's the kids, God bless them. And it, it was just horrendous. And again, I would talk to people, why are you dealing drugs? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? It was nothing like TV at all. There was a top maybe 1% to 5% that actually lived that life. But it also kind of made sure that you were humble. Because when you heard some of those backstories, like, damn, that could have been me. Not everyone was born with guns and drugs in their hands. Some people was their way of surviving. But as well, there's victims too, so everybody has to be held accountable. So learn to balance things. That was very instrumental and an integral part of my career, to learn balance. Drug control unit for five years, and then as the bio hit, I was an active shooter instructor for two years in the academy. And then I moved up in the ranks, sergeant, sergeant detective. And then this big guy, he's like 6'6", bigger than me, Ed Davis, calls me into headquarters one day. I'm a sergeant detective in Dorchester, love it. I came with two briefcases, one for a ceasefire, these two gangs that were battling it out, Wainwright Park and Cobman Square. And the other was something called computer statistics, Comstat, where you go over st st uh, statistical data to cover whatever crimes in your neighborhood. So I had no idea that the big man, Ed Davis, he asked me to become a deputy. I'm like, what? And trust me, there was a bet going on. They're like, you're not going to last six months if you go to the command staff, because you're going to tell it like it is, and you don't play politics. <laughs> so I came on board the command staff. I remember talking to Commissioner Davis. I'm like, before I accept this assignment, it's very important not to be taken as a token. And he respected that. And I said, no disrespect to you, but this is how I was raised. And people have been called tokens in the past. And I said, that's just not me. And as well, 
I will never shite on the officers in the street or the community either. And, and I did it. And so he respected that. And he gave me the command of Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester, Mission Hill, and just for fun, South Boston. <laughs> Boom, see, yeah. full circle. <laughs> And um, I learned a lot on the command staff. Again, all with the communities. I'm proud to say any community that I go to in Boston, I'm accepted. And um, that's because the village helped raise me and I never forgot where I came from. So from deputy there to deputy in the gang unit, the night commander, um, that was a superintendent. That was a rating, so I got a promotion. And oftentimes during interviews, How'd you get this? How'd you get that? And I would just point around. I'm like, the community. Definitely my mother. Definitely my core family. And my core family is people in the community that raised me. Doesn't have to be blood. Then, um, you know, Mayor Walsh comes in. We have a great discussion. Hey, I want you to be the chief or commissioner. I'm like, dude, you don't know me anything. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good at night commander, right? And he says, nope. And um, he appointed me as the first African-American chief. And I heard great feedback from the communities. One of the first things was, why do you have to say African-American? You earned this. You, you worked hard. You worked with us. And I says, listen, I'm a student of history. This just shows you where Boston is now. This would not have been possible in 1975. But because of everyone's hard work, supreme sacrifices that went before us, it's possible to have your first African-American uh, police chief. And followed by that, I did that for five years, and I stuck true to my guns, right back to the community. All communities, every community in Boston. And then I was appointed August 6, 19, I was gonna say 1918, gee. <laughs> Not quite, but 2018 as the first African-American commissioner, and again, Broke some rules there because there's supposed to be separation of church and state. I'm like, nope, I want to be sworn in in my mother's church, Morning Star Baptist Church. There was a thousand people in attendance. Everybody was there. And who did I have on stage with me, so to speak? I had teenagers from the neighborhood because you have to listen to teenagers too. They were part of the village. There were people there that were formerly incarcerated and every law enforcement entity because of the gang unit, drug control unit, multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency. I believe that if you're at each other's throats being egotistical and, and oh, forget this department. Don't, no, you know who's watching that? The bad guys. They love when we separate and we don't work together. It was an honor to look out at the congregation and see everybody there. Even the professional sports teams were there because, again, working with them over the years, they really gave back to the neighborhoods. So as commissioner, had some horrible things to face, things that were happening across the country, things that we addressed before 2018. There was also always the talk of not everyone's the same in the law enforcement family. In 2015, President Obama ordered a study in 21st century policing because of the shooting of unarmed black men and brown men and Caucasian men. Again, I tell the truth. I mentioned it all. The study was done um, by several major cities and headed by Charles Ramsey, a prominent African-American leader in law enforcement. And he went there way before I did, so he paved the road. Here's where we have some bragging rights here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. At the conclusion of the study, everyone convened in Washington, D.C., and the President Obama said, hey, there's six columns that will be used to solidify the foundation of any police department, state, local, or federal. And we talked about community policing, de-escalation, transparency, fair and impartial policing, bias-free policing, especially the community policing part. Shocked everyone when he says, you want to learn this? Go to Boston. What? <laughs> with that reputation of forced busing, with that reputation of the police department, with that reputation of the city, that took some hard work. But, nothing to my madness. Remember, when everyone started working together and learning about each other, 
we became one of the most successful police departments when it came to community policing. Because you should be working in partnership to solve problems and create a better quality of life. Not only is that a mission statement, but that's a vision too. And people need to hear it. Above like this crime happened here, this crime happened here. I'm proud to say we use every tier of social media to show people that you count and you're making a difference. Whether it was our Twitter account, Instagram, Facebook, web page, we show people when we work together, you make a heaven of a difference. So, with that being said, even after the 2015 study, it seemed like uh, across the nation we had these negative involvement with law enforcement. And it was really rocking the nation. So in Boston, we stayed true. If there was a shooting, we would, an officer involved shooting. I remember District Attorney Dan Conley, Commissioner Evans and myself had a discussion with them. Like if we have video, can we show it without jeopardizing the integrity of the case? And he agreed to it. So the, the tragedies that you saw as a result of officer-involved shootings across our great nation, especially Ferguson, where the body lay there, lie there and no one explained why. When it came to Boston, we would show the video, as I was telling uh, the good sergeant, I brought some grown folks to the table, certain politicians, certain reverends, and people from the community, like this is what really happened. This is as much as we can tell you. You're not our agents. Go talk to whomever, your congregation, um, your constituency, and let people know Boston's not Ferguson. We still have work to do. We're not perfect. But those are some of the things where we were way ahead of anyone else, and we still do that to this day. There was a recent officer-involved shooting, and that same procedure took place, place with District Attorney Rachel Rollins and people from the community, people from the command staff, like, this is what happened at this incident. This is as much as we can tell you, but you're not going to be in the dark for a year wondering if you have video, why didn't you show it? So again, 21st century policing, you have to take a step further and kind of put yourself out there sometimes for the betterment of the relationship with your police department and the community. And for my two and a half years as commissioner um, with Mayor Walsh, and the men and women of the Boston Police Department and the community, the mayor allowed me to create a Bureau of Community Engagement because everyone was tired of hearing community policing. I'm like, let's take it up a step further to make sure of all the aforementioned that I said about the entire village, that it was solidified and that Boston continued to be number one. You know, after the murder of Mr. Floyd, which again, Boston was one of the first to speak out against that. That was atrocious. The man didn't deserve to die that way. There were several protests across the nation and you saw it. <coughs> Black Lives Matter. And again, not everyone in Black Lives Matter was destroying the neighborhoods and burning down stuff. But here's something that was prevalent. In several of the major metropolises, you saw days and days of riots and looting. But when it came to Boston, one bad night, and then we handled our business. Again, multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency, and the people of the community said no. Because oftentimes the protesters, quite frankly, rich trust fund kids, never lived in the city. I don't know. A lot of their parents were one percenters and they came to wreak havoc. But the people in Boston says no. No, 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 no. One bad night. And that's something that everyone should pat their backs, including the community. There were some community activists that says, I'm gonna tell you what, you come into Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan with that crap, you're gonna wish you didn't. Some true street justice. So it didn't happen there. As well, we had a visit from the Attorney General of the United States, Barr, because President Obama said in 2015, we're doing the right thing. We had one bad night in comparison to other major metropolises that were suffering for weeks. This is where I talk politics. It was BS. 
The Attorney General of the United States is the top law enforcement executive in the country. He came to visit Boston to see what we're doing and how we were successful. We had a two hour meeting in which all I did was tout the neighborhoods and how we're working together. And most of the problems came from, from people that weren't even from the city of Boston, sharing their views, but in a negative way. Weren't using their voices of logic, but the ignorance of destruction. We talked about that. We also talked about foreign and domestic terrorism and how this is ample grounds for someone to come in and wreak havoc on our nation. Certain politicians didn't like it. How dare you talk to the Attorney General of the United States? I'm like, well, he's the top executive. And the last time I checked, this man that's very keen on history, all inclusive, this black man in the 21st century, I know this, have the conversation. See what people want to talk about. So I told a couple politicians, if you're trying to tell me a black man who to talk to in the 21st century, you got another thing coming. <laughs> and some were women of color. I'm like, I cannot believe this. The Attorney General of the United States, it doesn't mean I share his views. It means that I'm willing to have a conversation about what we're doing in Boston. And God damn it, if you think you can tell me what to do, then you're a 21st century overseer. You mean to tell me? You can't talk to someone unless I like them from my political party. I'll tell you when, where, and how. No, that's called an overseer. So you may have seen me on the news with that. I stuck to my guns and told exactly what we talked about. Again, it just showcased Boston that we weren't burning night after night because we were working together. And again, we still have a lot of work to do, but we're the leaders in the nation. So politics and 21st century policing is now affecting a lot of our major metropolises. We have the far left and the far right. Nobody wants to talk. After the election, the presidential election where President Biden was elected, they had an interview on a major news station of James Clyburn. He's the top Democratic whip. He's African American. He's from North Carolina. And he said, sir, you still lost several seats in a great nation to the Republican Party. What do you attribute that to? And trust me, folks, look it up. He says, we should have never tired of talking about defund the police. Are you kidding me? President Obama also followed suit. Defund the police? No, that's not the way to go. Then, Mr. Clyburn also said, unfortunately, a lot of members of our party don't want to have the conversation. It's my way or the highway. Again, if you are a politician, you are responsible to your constituency, no matter what that constituency is. Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Independent, you just can't pick one side. And that's a message to the far left and far right. And they are able to make our great nation better. Everyone has to come together to the middle and have that conversation. And then start working on problems the true way having that conversation. I often mention the murder of Mr. Floyd and the time it took, as people saw, police officers turn into murderers, eight minutes and 46 seconds. Why can't we take that time and split it? Take four minutes, 23 seconds, each side, and start having conversations and keep doing it over and over again so we can find out what we have in common, what we don't like, uh, adhere to constructive criticism and move our nation on. It's too separated right now. There are people who, in my opinion, they love this. You're definitely getting a lot of play from newspaper, a lot of play in media. And people are being judged from an excerpt, a clip. Oh, you're guilty. Oh, you're innocent. You're not seeing the whole picture. And that's another thing. We need to start talking to each other so we get the big picture. We get the entire story. And that we don't get all that we learned from a, news, from a newspaper or the media. What happened before there were newspapers and medias? We talked to each other. It's time to get back to that. Boston was attacked twice by terrorism. We defeated it both times because of the people. 
as my brother, Mr. President, alluded to earlier, the Boston Marathon bombing, where those two cowards killed the innocents and injured several other innocents um, that were there on a nice day. It was like 72 degrees. We honored the victims of Sandy Hook and that mass shooting. Things were going great until the two bombs went off. But I tell you what, I'm going to end it soon, I promise. We showed what Boston was about in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, what we were about. 101 hours to catch those cowards. 101 hours of working with the community, state, local, and federal law enforcement entities because those cowards attacked our city and our country. Put all your differences aside and start to work together. And again, we use Twitter to help people shelter, shelter in place, Instagram, Facebook, the media to showcase when we work together, we kick ass, 101 hours. And in Watertown that night, and I don't care who's watching, that movie President's Day was not all inclusive, <laughs> did not include all ethnicities. The only brother you saw in that movie was driving the commissioner. Come on. <laughs> Mr. President, you are a brother, right? <laughs> just, say, just checking. <laughs> so there was not fair representation in that movie as well. There's a young man that died, Dennis Simmons. A young man in his late 20s, a pipe bomb went off in close proximity to him in Watertown by one of the cowards. He was out for three months, and as a young man, I want to rush back to work because he had heart and desire, and he wanted to get back to the gang unit. A year later, he dies of a massive brain aneurysm. But Vice President Biden and the Attorney General Eric Holder made sure that was considered an in the line of duty death. He wasn't even mentioned in that movie. So take it for what you want, who's ever looking. You'll never see me watch that movie because it's not all inclusive and it didn't include everyone that made the ultimate sacrifice. But again, Watertown, I had been up 24 hours. I was on Dexter Ave with, and I'll break it down demographically, at 60 troops, 10 sergeants of all ethnicities, 60 troops of all ethnicities, and we worked hand in hand with the state police and everyone else that self-deployed that day and night, and we searched and searched and searched. And I went home the next day at about three. I briefed uh, Commissioner Ed Davis and Chief Linsky. I went home, and then I got a call. Get your ass back over here. He's on a boat in Franklin App, so boom. We go back, and I'm in communication. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm back. I'm the night commander, superintendent. And there were already people deployed around that house. And that's where I met Mr. President, who we know each other. We had to stop droves and droves that just wanted to run up there. Here's why you do that. When you just self-deploy, you're going to have crossfire. You're going to have everything. You're going to jeopardize that neighborhood and the fellow officers. We had enough people at the scene. Boy, we took some heat, but we didn't take any heat. We're like, you're not going up there, that's it. And people were looking at amazement as the Boston Police Department and state police were like this. But Mr. President, let's tell the folks what happened when we captured that coward. Everywhere we went from Watertown back to Boston, hundreds and thousands of people were cheering. I tell you what I took from that. We kicked their ass. We held them accountable. We did this. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where the nation began, we showed people what can happen when you work together. I'm always that way. I take a lot of heat by holding certain people accountable, whether you're a judge, you're a lawyer, I don't care, police. Chocolate Belichick, do your job, no days off. <laughs> right? So thank you for allowing me to burn your ears off. Now you know my rich and storied history. It's all about all God's children, and I love that we started here with a bit of humor and honoring God, God, country, family.
again, you exude service above self. So thank you for allowing me to speak today. I know it's getting a little late, but any questions for the commissioner? Yeah, if you have questions, I will answer any and all questions. As I've done in high schools, colleges, I'm like, be prepared because I'm going to answer, but I'll ask some questions back. So I know it's late, but that's on my countryside. I'll talk your ears off. <laughs> but you're sure as heaven is going to get, you're going to get the point. So, yes, sir. Commissioner, you, you've touched on it about the difference between these burning, cities burning, and Boston, mm -hmm. the relation between the two, the differences between the two. Is it the same thing that's going on in California right now? These groups smashing grabs and... You won't believe the makeup of these groups, specifically Antifa. A lot of these kids are rich, right? And there's also, I have to say allegedly, that there's a billionaire named Soros that's funding a hell of a lot of people, allegedly. And every major metropolis that voted far left, defund the police, cut the services, has failed. I always said when I teach the kids, don't take my word for it if I teach you something, look it up. You look up the crime rate in New York, yes. Chicago, Baltimore, Portland, Seattle. Recently, I was in the FBI National Executive Institute in St. Augustine, and I was there with a chief from Portland and a chief from Seattle, where the crime rate's up 400%, 800%. And guess what's being asked now? Can we get the officers back? <laughs> well, no shit. <laughs> Why don't you think of that? Because I'm going to tell you, when you talk about cut funding and do this and that, let's work out solutions. You are bolstering the confidence of criminals. They're like, wow, I got a mayor, a senator, this, what? I don't have to go to jail? You're going to cut? Whoa, the people that, you're going to cut them? I can do what we want. Look at all these smash and grabs. Are you kidding me? What are the retailers saying? Don't take my word for it. Well, damn it, nobody gets locked up. And you keep coming back. Are you kidding me? It's time for the country to wake up, both sides to start working together, and the accountability piece. It doesn't matter what color you are. If you're a victim of crime, you want justice. You don't want to hear like, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to do this and trying to do that. What about the victims? I'm going to let you out because you could get sick. Has the person be re been rehabilitated? I got in trouble for that one, too, and I smile. Why are you against uh, prisoners being released? Because they could catch COVID-19. I says, well, let's talk about our houses of correction in Massachusetts. They're at about 43 to 46% capacity. So you can build an infirmary and keep folks there until they're rehabilitated. Are we, do we all pay taxes? Yes. When somebody goes to jail and they're incarcerated, we're paying to make sure they're rehabilitated so they can return to society and be a part without violating the constitutional rights of your fellow citizens. So yeah, I took the heat. I'm like, I could care less whether someone could get sick or not. We need to concentrate on why people are being released without a certificate of rehabilitation without a voucher for housing, without money for food, and just necessities? And where's the physical and mental health care going to kick in that you had there? And you want to talk about fairness? You're releasing people back into neighborhoods that are having severe challenges because of COVID-19. Unemployment, crowded housing, which commits to more COVID, what are you doing? Well, you know, you got to do the right thing. You're not doing the right thing. I have a list. Child pornographer, let go. A murderer, Utley. Arrested for OUI, one year. Shoots up the neighborhood, electronic bracelet, out on that, goes to a party, and here we go, allegedly kills a man. Release because, oh, he could get sick. That is a smack in the face to any victim. So yeah, a lot of what's going on is just absolutely ridiculous. 
Yes, there is a need for reform. But when you talk about reform, remember, we're all about 21st century policing, community policing. That means the entire village has to work on respecting each other, right? And you go the drastic means, they're the bad guys looking in that are going to take advantage. And that's what's happening. But the pendulum's swinging back now because people are getting tired. And those same uh, elected officials that keep harping on that, they're not getting back in at all. And um, so, sorry, I told you, I give very thorough answers. <laughs> but again, thank you for letting me burn your ears off. <laughs> Mr. Christmas. President. A couple months ago, you gave me a challenge coin. Uh-oh. And I have to repay that. At the time, I didn't have one, but I'm going to repay that challenge coin to you. <laughs> this is how you present challenge coins. It started with the military. Yes. So you shake hands. So if he doesn't have my challenge coin, which you had, he has to buy me the drinks and the food and everything. And that's an expensive tab. You got a lot of happy dollars. But thank you, sir. Could you come forward a little bit? Sure. Governor, you come forward? Massachusetts, you're supposed to say governor. <laughs> governor. governor. <laughs> Commissioner, on behalf of um, the Rotary Club of Lexington and your generous uh, offering your time to us, uh, Rotary Club is going to um, make a donation against our eradication oh. against policy, a polio, uh, to try and eradicate 40 um, children. So oh, thank you. That's an honor. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stand by. Oh, this is cool. I don't take any of these for granted. I thank my mama. First, I thank God, my mother, and the village that raised me. Sargento, you're coming up here. All right. Thank you. One more question. Yes. You know why I like you being a photographer? Here's why. I'm holding my stomach in. Thank you. Yeah. I'm focusing. Like, come on, dude. I'm going to hyperventilate. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Last honor. thing we have is the 50 50 raffle. This is nice, man. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Sir. I wanted to play the name game. Do you remember a guy named Bud Coleman? Yes. So, my oh, TV still on. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky we didn't go into that story. All right. 50 50 raffle. I'll definitely give that back to you, brother. Take your orange juice. Appreciate it. I'll give you that chocolate. I'll let you know. It is a. <laughs> he knows it. <laughs> And the last four numbers are 2892. 2892. Thank you very much. Thank you.